Wow. Well, I just wanted to quickly thank Stuart um, for, for organizing this and for inviting me and um, also to all the other presenters. I could stay here for another two days and listen to these papers. It's been so fascinating. Um, and also, we were talking last night about just the great dialogue that we've had going in this room. You know, not the, you know ha it feels like we've had a real conversation, which has been fantastic. So, um, I work in international politics, so I look at all of these issues about cybersecurity and, uh, and internet governance and internet freedom from an international politics perspective. And, and try and you know think about the implications of them for for things like global security and global order and uh, and uh, state relations and the project that I've been working on for the last uh, 12 months is this public pri is it taking a critical look at the public private partnership in, in national cybersecurity strategies um, so I'm kind of picking up from where Anel left off or maybe funneling a little bit deeper into the sort of broad picture that he's painted for us. Um, in, in terms of how states deal with this issue. So, so as, as he, he gave that beautiful sort of overview of um, national cybersecurity strategies, states have for a long, long time had a, um, a national security strategy which basically is a picture of what, what the global security and order um, context is at any given time and how best to promote their state interests within that that um, structure, and that's something that administrations in, in many, many countries um, develop on an ongoing basis. But, but as Inal showed us, it's sort of, well, the United States started in the 90s, but over the last particularly sort of five or six years, developing a national cybersecurity strategy has, uh, we've seen an explosion in them. So initially it was just a subset, and now they've got their own, you know, it's a dedicated document. Um, now, in, uh, whoops, in most of these, or many of these documents, um, and I've looked at a lot of them, there are some sort of common themes. So how are, how are states thinking about national cybersecurity when they write these documents? Um, and one of the things that we see over and over again is that this thing called the public-private partnership is a cornerstone or a hub a, a very fundamental element of how states are conceptualizing their cybersecurity. And so that, and that's one of the reasons why I needed to look at it. it. It's very interesting from an international politics perspective because this idea of a public-private partnership in the context of national security sort of disrupts this very, um, you know, long-held expectation that one of the key purposes of the state is to provide security. Right? That's one of the reasons why we, we gather together in states, in these communities of states. And so talking about outsourcing that in the way that we do in, a, in the context of cybersecurity sort of disrupts that fundamental purpose of the state. So it's interesting for, for us Interpol people from that perspective. Um, as Inal pointed out, it's quite, and this particular public-private partnership is quite indistinct. The, the arrangements are very unclear, and the lines of responsibility and the lines of accountability are, are, are quite unclear, and that's not typical of a public-private partnership. And, but what I think is that sort of acknowledging the challenges of this relationship are really important to thinking in a more sophisticated way about national cybersecurity. Um, and so, so certainly not to suggest that, that uh, the public-private partnership isn't important or essential, but that it's pretty, uh, in my view, it's pretty deeply flawed the way we discuss it as it is. So, so the reason why this public-private partnership is, is so fundamental, there are good reasons for it. Um, you know, one of the, the long-held political anxieties about cyber terrorism has been this potential for an attack on critical infrastructure, the sort of cyber Pearl Harbor, and it goes back a long way, and politicians have been consistently anxious and nervous and worried that someday we're going to see a kind of die-hard four um, scenario. Um, now, in places like the UK and the United States, over the last sort of couple of decades, and this is something Tim's done a lot of work on, um, the critical infrastructure has been privatized. So we now have a co kind of concentration of, um, of uh, critical infrastructure in private hands. But, it, but, but at the same time, this protection of this critical infrastructure has come to be seen as a national security threat. 
Okay, so, so, so this sort of shift and change over the last couple of decades to where we, we've moved the ownership of this very important infrastructure into private hands, and, but this threat has evolved, which makes it um, uh, very much a national security paper. And I thought this sort of was very interested in um, Karen's work on sort of the state's obligation. What, where does the state's obligation begin and end in the context of, um, of uh, providing security and, and protection? So, so in, in this paper, I'm just going to quickly go through. I'm not going to do the first one just in the interest of time, but, but just that I have sort of analyzed these documents for actually what are the... What do these policymakers mean when they talk about national cybersecurity? Because we're all, you know, familiar with the kind of s sort of definitional ambiguity of cybersecurity or indeed security itself. So I sort of do go through and, and look at what do they mean by this when they talk about it. But I I'm not going to talk about it today, but I'm happy to take questions on it. And then I look at the, the literature on public-private partnerships. There's a whole body of, of work that comes from um, public policy that, that sort of talks about how these things work, variations in them, and, and, and so I go through that quickly. Then I just want to talk about how governments see this relationship from these strategy documents and how the private sector regards this relationship. And then I'll just talk about some of the implications that I, I think there are for responsibility and, and accountability in this context. So we'll skip through this bit. So, so public-private partnerships, of course, have a long history. I mean, some, some of these scholars sort of date them back to the Bible and, uh, you know, the tax collector in the temple and stuff like that. So there's nothing new or, or unusual about the private sector and the public sector collaborating uh, um, to, to get things done. There, there's generally an expectation that these partnerships form because neither part, party can, or, or not neither, but one or the other or both, parties cannot achieve their goals alone. So there's a purpose that they, that they work together, and we can kind of think that through in this context sort of quite clearly. Um, but typically, there are very clear lines of responsibility and authority. So for, for, for a sort of uh, public-private partnership, say, to build a, uh, a bridge or some piece of physical infrastructure, there would be very, very clear um, contracts and very clear expectations of who was paying for what and who was delivering and, and timelines and all that kind of thing, so that there was no um, uncertainty about what, what the relationship was. Um, it also implies this kind of um, element of mutual obligation and trust. So this very non-hierarchical language that we see in these strategy documents about this partnership implies a kind of equality or, or, or some kind of um, yeah, closer relationship than a contractual relationship. And a lot of this literature that looks at, at the P3 talks about how in, in it's sort of, um, it's almost just a discourse. It's because because the, the kind of terms of outsourcing and privatization of the sort of 70s and 80s kind of fell out of fashion. And what came into fashion to replace them was this language of partnership. And so a lot of scholars that look at at public-private partnerships would question, you know, whether this, this, you know, this rise of the discourse is, is meaningful or whether it's just kind of a, a fashionable term. But what it indicates, I think, in, it sort of quite crucially in this context, is a sort of loss of faith in both the state and the market. So there's an understanding that that neither of, of those parties can achieve their goals on, on their own. The state, because it's, it's big and clumsy and it's not good at innovation, that's really what the private sector does so well. And then the market, because, well, we need someone to oversee the market. And we, and we don't completely trust that the, that the market will follow through on, on what we regard as uh, appropriate level of national security. So there's this fundamental um, sense that there's a, there's a problem there. Now, when governments write these strategy documents and the way they talk about this public-private partnership in cybersecurity, is they, the, the language is very much that this is a joint and shared pursuit. And you see this over and over again, this, this idea that we're all in it together and everyone has to row the boat in the same direction and, and we'll be fine. They also see it as very much a, um, a solution to this mandate and capability gap. So, so politicians will often make the comment that 
It's not the government's mandate or responsibility to act as a sort of sysadmin for, for private networks. That that's, that's not their responsibility. But furthermore, they just don't have what's necessary. The private sector has the kind of skills and the thinking and the um, innovation. And so it's very much seen as a, a, as a role that the private sector is best equipped to take the lead on and that they should take the lead on that. And one of the major, major elements of this public-private partnership in these strategy documents is an emphasis on information sharing. So the way that we'll, we'll enhance this partnership, the way that we'll deal with, with the cyber security or cyber insecurity is by sharing information. The government will, will um, make sure that they offer timely and actionable information to the, to the private sector. And the private sector is, is under an obligation to share that information back to the, to the um, public sector so that it can be disseminated. Now, the private sector doesn't quite see it the same way, unsurprisingly. So first of all, the private sector is very clear about this. They do not expect to be funding national security. So, so, so the private sector, when, when, uh, when an organization that owns a, uh, you know, a critical infrastructure thinks about how they will um, uh, fund and develop their cybersecurity, their internal cybersecurity, they think about that with a, well, they think about it in a basically a cost benefit model. So we, we will pay so much because it, if we pay less than that, an attack will be more expensive but there, than, than it is to prevent it. Right? So it's sort of like the way we all think about our own security. Andy was just showing me some, some uh, antivirus software that I'm going to install on my, my Mac when I leave here, but I'm going to pay for it. So, but I'm thinking, well, it's worth it. How much is it? I'll, I'll, is it worth it for me to pay? Yes, it is. I'll buy it. If not, I will say, no, I'll take the chance. I may be vulnerable, but I'll run my risk. And there's also insurance in that, that equation as well for corporations. So, so when companies think about that, they do it in that context. And what they're very clear about is that they will take responsibility to protect their infrastructure from criminals or, or um, some kind of low-level attacks or whatever would be responsible and whatever would be profitable. Beyond that, first of all, they, they don't have the um, you know, sanction of their shareholders to spend more than what would, would be profitable. But secondly, they would say, if we're talking about an attack, on the state, a national security issue, that is not our remit. That's what the state is for. So that if, if we're talking about a, a you know organized crime, then then we can get crime and we can get law enforcement involved. If we're talking about a military attack or an attack by a state, certainly is not for the private sector to be funding that kind of security. And so we have this fundamental disjuncture that um, in, in Anal pointed to of the the public good and profit do not easily meet in this partnership. Now, um, they definitely expect this t sort of timely and actionable information from the government, but they can be very hesitant to share their own information. And for, in fairness, for some very good reasons, right? Because one of them is that if they do have information um, that, that they can use to, you know, for, for financial advantage and their competitors do not, well, then that's a very, you know, that's a very difficult question to think about sharing information that's giving you a competitive edge, um, you know, for the greater good of society. And the, again, you know, w w what would shareholders say about that? Um, um, also, some, some uh, uh, people who work in, in these organizations have said to me that it's not always I immediately clear when they're looking at an incident that should be reported. So they may suffer you know, thousands and thousands of I intrusions or, or low-level attacks, and it's not always immediately clear to them when they're, they're facing something sort of substantial that should be, that should be um, reported. So there are lots of reasons, but fundamentally the private sector ca can be quite hesitant to share information, and that's the kind of basic foundation of this partnership in these strategy documents. So, um, What's wrong with the P3? So, so, so first of all, this problem that they rely on this kind of 
um, shared or confluent goals. And fundamentally, I don't think there is a shared goal in this partnership. The, the private sector has, has a goal of um, you know, making money and, and, and taking due responsibility for their, their, their uh, infrastructure, but that's very different from a goal of national security. Those are, not the, those are not the same goals at all. And I think we have to be absolutely crystal clear about that. The private sector is, is not um, in the business of providing national security. Also, this problem that profitability is, is often incompatible with the public good, and that's why the government does stuff. Right? That's, that's why um, you know, we can have private hospitals and public hospitals, the really expensive stuff, um, still has to be provided by the government because it's not profitable, which you know, we're, we're, we're fine with, but we acknowledge that in the health system. You can have a private hospital where, where you get you know, um, uh, plastic surgery and, 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 and things like that that are expensive and are profitable, but when people are really sick, they need a public hospital. So, so it, it, the, the, again, there's this kind of fundamental disjuncture there. And then it raises this question of, can the state actually outsource national security? It's different, I think it's fundamentally different to hiring, say, um, private contractors in a war zone or, 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 or something like that, because again, they have a very clear relationship. We want you to protect this embassy, there's your, your budget, this is what we expect from you, go and do it. Um, and, and also this, this big problem of whether, or should, will or should, the private sector accept liability for, for national security? Well, I certainly don't think they will, but whether they should is another question. So the implications of this for international politics and this kind of global security and global order questions um, sort of come back to this thing that national security has always been understood to be a core function of the state. And some people would even say it's the purpose of the state. So, so if, if, if critical infrastructure or critical information infrastructure is now regarded as, as integral to national security, and we have to rely on the public-private partnership to provide it, then what does that say about how well the state is equipped to provide security? Um, and, and sort of, you know, what are the implications of that then for, for national and, and international security? Are states that don't rely on a, on a public-private partnership in this context better equipped to deal with, with the information age than, than states that do? And how can we think through the, the kind of problems of this partnership if we, if, we, um, if we continue to rely on it? How can we think it through in a way that it makes sense and it's a real partnership as opposed to um, what we have now? Thank you.